I did I did hit record. <laughs> so this will be this will be uh, part of the permanent record okay, here on okay, Earth. Okay. So. But I can I can repeat it too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, no, okay. So Candace insisted that I bring microchips for everyone since it is a computer class, and now that will be forever embedded on the internet. Uh, so, hi, my name is Matt. I work with Neo LaunchNet. We are a free and unlimited business coaching and mentoring service here on campus to any and all students. Um, one of the events that we have coming up, we have LC's first ever hackathon, and there doesn't need to be any elements of programming, um, technology, anything like that, but if you would like to have elements of that in your presentation, if you do choose to compete, feel free to do so. So the hackathon, we are trying to find ways to improve student wellness. So any ideas you may have around a tutoring service, an application, um, if you would like to code uh, websites around it, anything like that, you can um, come out and compete. You can win up to $500. That's going to be November 18th and the 20th. So the 18th is an ideation day. And then the 20th, you're going to be presenting. And that's from 11 to 2 each day. And it's going to be, um, is anyone familiar with the show Shark Tank? So you're going to be pitching to local investors, and then $500 prize, $250 for second place, and then $150 for the third place. And you don't so. have to do it alone. You can do it in groups. Yep, up to five. So if anyone's interested in that, my business cards are up here, as well as the flyer. Um, I'm also over a group of amazing students uh, called Unity Lab, that Candace is actually one of them, and she's going to tell you a little bit about Unity Lab. So Unity Lab is a student-run graphic design and marketing agency. Um, we do all of our meetings with clients. Um, Matt comes to them at first, and then we get to take over and meet with them ourselves. We do um, branding, we do websites, we do photography. Anything under marketing, we can branch out and do. We've got three web developers right now. We're looking for more. Always. So, <laughs> I have a job description here, but it's really fun. You get paid, it's like a paid internship. You build your portfolio, and then when you graduate with whatever degree you're getting, you have experience behind you, so it helps you get a good job. So. Paid internships are tough to find. I wish that more of them would have existed when I was a student, so take advantage of as many paid hours as you can get. Um, so I sort of, I'll give you a little bit of my background. I started out as an unpaid intern here at Lorain County Community College. I always knew this is where I wanted to work. So I did over 1,000 unpaid hours, and then um, Janice hired me on part-time, and I've been able to move up, and now I'm the program coordinator of Neo LaunchNet and Unity Lab. So stick around long enough and work for free, and sometimes people will keep you around. Or work not for free at Unity Lab. <laughs> <laughs> I did bring footballs for everyone, so we have our homecoming event at Neo LaunchNet. We don't have a football team or a homecoming event, so we thought, why not start one? We started one last year, and what it is is we invite some of the, our past businesses that we've helped start to come back and market uh, their businesses, their products, anything like that. So that is going to be the Tuesday in between the Monday and Wednesday of the hackathons. That's going to be the 19th of November. Come out and enjoy some of the food from the food trucks, and say hello to us, and tell me I tell bad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> what, are, what are some of the jobs that you've done? Um, Every one that I've worked with has been a nonprofit organization so far, um, and I've made a website for the Lorraine County Manufacturing Partnership and for Pompeii Alliance. So one of them has been health centered, and then one of them has been manufacturing. Um, Are any of them live? Are they live? They're both live. Do Do you want to show them? Sure. Okay. Uh, If you hit the button on the wall that says on. And just, yeah, and just pull down the projector and navigate to it. What, so what, what technologies do you use? Um, WordPress and Wix have been what I've used, but we generally do whatever the client has already. Most of them try to make their own website and then realize it's a lot more work and a lot more involved than they thought, and then they come to us to finish it. What dimension do you think having this job has given you as opposed to strictly the academic uh, world, you know, uh, just taking classes? What what extra things have it provided for you? Um, just working in different
different platforms is really nice and learning how to code in the different environments because they're all pretty different. I mean, they use the same principles, but figuring out things is a little harder sometimes. Um, just being able to problem solve, I think, is the biggest thing. And working with real clients is really nice because then you get to understand the dynamic of timing that it takes to actually do a project versus doing it for homework. Um, I don't know, I like it a lot, it's really fun. So this is one of the pages that I made. It's a pretty simple nonprofit page. This is the coolest thing that we did was we had our graphic designers make this graphic and then I had to code this so that was fun to do. And that was all in Wix version of jQuery. So. But working with clients is the biggest challenge and the biggest reward I think because Everyone has different ideas of what's professional and what's not, and getting content is sometimes a challenge, but in the end, they all get what they ask for, so. Well, that, that almost sounds like a threat. that I did the Pompeii Alliance site, we had a team of graphic designers and there were two other developers working on it. So we had to divide up tasks and um, getting on and off of the sites and working at the same time was kind of an issue at first. So we had to always be in contact with each other when we knew who was working on what because things wouldn't save properly if you have two people in there at the same time. Um, working with the graphic designers is we didn't really work together, they just had their tasks and then we would communicate, okay, this is what we need, this is the size of the graphic we need. Um, but I don't have a lot of graphic design knowledge, so it was mostly relying on their expertise to fill in the gaps with that. Does anyone have any questions? We're looking to find me to talk about Unity Lab or Neo Launch that we are in the Campana building. We have a garage door, um, so we're the only office on campus that has a garage door. We're not, not hard to find. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. position of hiring entry-level people, all right, hiring people just out of school. And when you're in that position, a lot of the resumes look identical, all right? You know, someone that, you know, depending on where they went to, you know, they talk about the classes that they took. And everyone takes more or less the same classes. You know, one school might call it something else or have a little bit different focus or whatever, but the classes are similar. Uh, the, the work that people have to put themselves through, through school a lot of times is similar. And the background is very similar. 
it's really hard in a situation like that to distinguish who is a really good candidate and who isn't as good of a candidate. It's really hard. Everyone tends to blend in together. So it's real easy for someone that is really good to maybe get lost in the shuffle, all right? Uh, simply because, not because they're not good, but because their resume doesn't show how good they are, all right? Uh, <laughs> but what you can do to distinguish yourself, anything that you can do to distinguish yourself is generally something good. So when I talk to employers, when I talk to Highland, when I talk to uh, Foundation Software, some of the big employers that hire a lot of people, uh, the one thing they talk about is people that do stuff beyond just classroom work. All right, and that can take a lot of different forms. That you you know it could be an internship, uh, you know, paid or unpaid. I really, unpaid internships sort of bug me, all right? Uh, I won't pass along my values, because if you want to take one, no shame, all right? Good for you. It's your choice. But it sort of bugs me that people are getting free labor from, from students, all right? Uh, but again, I, I recognize, it, you know, it's your choice, and you got to do what you got to do. Uh, paid internships, of course, are, are great. Stuff that you do for a hobby, all right? Put up a fan site for something that you're into. That sounds dumb. That sounds trivial. You could do that very cheaply. For a very inexpensive amount, you could, you know, probably, I'm, I'm thinking like with GoDaddy, maybe $5 a month. You could publish a, a, a fan site about something that you're interested in, all right? Uh, or you could publish an online portfolio of your work, all right? Or you could uh, work on open source projects. Uh, check out GitHub. GitHub is a, 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 a repository where people check in software, and you can take it and actually create what's called a fork, where you can take what they've worked on and maybe move it in another direction. There's a lot of places where you could put your work, just depending on what you do. One place I, I put my work ages ago, uh, unfortunately, all of my stuff on there is written in an uh, obsolete version of the language, but there's a, a, a graphic, uh, uh, there's a graphics audio multimedia tool called Processing. And there's a website called Open Processing. And the language is Java-based, and you can do all kinds of really cool artistic stuff. Let me bring it up, just to show you what I mean, just because it's cool. So, all right, here's, let's just find a sketch. It's this little graphic that draws this. You can actually see the code somewhere. There we go. And this, for people that recognize it, is just straight up Java code. And notice how it's really not that much, right? It's just a page or so more of stuff that does this graphics. This kind of programming I find fun after doing, uh, like, being involved in, well, my career when I was a software developer was business programming, right? I mean, accounting stuff is not that exciting, right? But writing visualizations like this, it can be really cool. Uh, let's find another one. Oh, this one looks nice. Now you might say to yourself, what does this have to do with if I'm going to get an internship at Highland Software? My job isn't going to be doing stuff like this. It's not about, for these kinds of projects, uh, 
if your job is going to do this. This shows about your skill, and this shows about your um, initiative that you take to do stuff. Well, that's really So if you can show skill in one area of programming, chances are you're going to be skilled in another area, right? And if you show that you're the kind of person that makes the extra effort, well, that's going to help you regardless of what kind of job you're going to go for. So I strongly encourage everyone to try to do something outside of classroom work. All right? And I know it's hard, right? I know it's hard. But it is one thing that gives you an edge. Uh, when you go for a uh, uh, an internship. Besides Unity Lab, there's career services where you can investigate internships and so on. So try to consider that, uh, especially as you're getting a little bit further along uh, in your in your progress. Any questions about any of this? I just want to play on processing all day now. So thanks, class, for destroying my ambition. All right. Or should I say refocusing my ambition to something? I got to see what Nyan Cat is doing. Put space, arrows to move. Oh. Score zero. <laughs> I know I didn't do that great, but come on. Okay, here's what we're going to do today. <coughs> uh, I actually changed Lab 10 assignment uh, a little bit to start with a new project because adding user IDs and all to a new project is easier than adding to uh, uh, or, or than taking an existing project and adding it. There's a tutorial for both of these things and a lot of other things as well, but I, uh, I, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, I, we'll look at the tutorial, but we won't execute it step by step. Originally it was my plan to work through the tutorial. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off uh, to uh, create a brand new site. We'll create just a simple model and we'll show you how passwords work and how the user IDs work. Are there any questions before we go on with this? Any old questions on old business? Okay, so let's go in and let's create a new application. So I'll go up, up here, file, new, project. I'm going to create oops, under web. I'm going to create an ASP.NET web, uh, core web application. Next. Going to give it a, a name and put a location. We'll say, um, what do we want to have? Um, an announcement site, a site that displays news stories or something. All right, and I will put it on the desktop. Create. It's going to come to this page <clears throat> in a minute here. All right. We want it to be a web application with some example core pages. All right. Uh, with example, uh, yeah, core application pages, example razor pages. I'm going to click authentication to no from no authentication. I'm going to change it. No authentication means that there's no built in like login facility and so on. So I'm going to click change and I'm going to say that there are individual user accounts. 
And you have some choices about how to handle this. All right? Uh, how many of you have seen things like if you go to, uh, I get this a lot on my phone, but it also happens in desktop websites, where like if you go to, uh, trying to think, like a, a ticket servicing company that sells tickets, whoever they are, Ticketmaster or, or one of them, um, it'll give you an option to log in with Facebook. All right, uh, that would be connect to an existing user store in the cloud. Uh, another big example that I see is, do you want to connect with your with your Google account? All right, and I'm sure there's others as well. Uh, we're not going to do that, at least not yet. We're going to say, I want to store the user accounts within the application. So we're not co connecting to some other services. All our stuff is out on the web. So I'm going to go, yeah. If you were having your own login and then having something like connecting to another thing like Google, would you still use store user accounts and add them? Would you use the other option? It, it, well, it depends what you mean by connect. Um, not login as, but like, I don't know, like just some websites allow you to connect it and use it for some. Uh, yeah, you probably would still use store user accounts in app. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to click OK and create. And it's going to do its thing and create it. And we're going to get a nice scaffolded. web page that contains all our stuff here. All right. So, I'm going to run this now. Ah, I got to migrate the database because actually it creates some database tables. So I'm going to go here to my package manager. And I could create a migration. Initial. Going to think about it for a while. All right. And then I'm going to say update database. And it's going to go and going to create all the tables necessary for the database. There's actually a lot of them, believe it or not, because you can do a lot of things with logon. Normally, we think of logon as being, you know, you're logged in or you're not. All right, but if you think about it in a larger application, there are roles that people can have. Maybe someone can see certain data but can't edit it, and so on. So it gets kind of involved. Let's look at the database to see what was created. So we'll go and we'll view. This, by the way, I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing the tutorial. If you go through, I think, the first page of the tutorial, and we'll look at that in a second, uh, you'll see this stuff. There's all the tables that get created as a part of that. Okay, so let's open up the tutorial.
so that we can see what we have and let's look at some things in there <coughs> excuse me before we continue This is in this tutorial. It's called identity. Uh, let me get the correct terms. Entity framework. Entity framework is like the database stuff. Identity, entity framework, identity assembly provides the facility for logging on. So let's look at the tutorial. And we're more or less working through this first page, creating a web app with authentication, because we've done all this stuff. This is pretty much where we're at. We've looked at the, da uh, the database. Uh, this I found a little bit confusing in the tutorial. These are some things that you can do to set options as far as like what the password has to be. There's defaults to this and then you can override the defaults. I didn't change any of the defaults obviously, but that's something you can do. That'd be something to play with. And this shows that added on to the configure method tells it to use authentication so that your application is smart enough to know that it has to use um, to use authentication. So let's go back and look at this. If we look at program Right here is where they had this stuff. No, this stuff. So notice we're adding these, we're configuring the services. So we can configure the services uh, for the identity and specify what password. Right now, notice we don't have any of that here. All right, so we're just taking the defaults for that. Uh, if we look at the other file, I need a bigger screen. No, not the other file, the other function. We are set up to use the authentication. So it's going to go and it's going to use authentication. All right. So now we should be okay to run this. So I'm going to run this. And as we look, we get our usual sort of warning messages. We have a couple extra options on our scaffolded pages. We have a register and log in. All right, notice we didn't have that before. So if I click register, it will allow me to create, uh, it'll allow me to create a user account. And it creates it, very, by default, it creates it very minimal. So uh, for now, that's all we really need to do. We just need the ability to log in. All right, so. I give an email here. I put
put in a password. I'm going to type in just something dumb like password just to see what happens. I click register. It's completing. Must have at least one non-numeric character. Must have at least one digit or uppercase. So what I'm going to do is capital P at sign SSWORD exclamation point. So like that. Please use something fairly simple when you create login credentials. And in fact, display it on this screen what you used. So not <laughs> you wouldn't do that in a real application, certainly, but for me grading your work. Um or you just include it in the comments too. Or if you're showing me in lab, you'll be able to log in, so I guess you don't really need to do that. A S S W O R D. I think I spelled it wrong. And I click register and oh, I need a number too. I'm going to use a zero instead of an O in password. No. I'm going to use a 4 instead of an A in password. We'll use some leet speak here. So I think that will work. All right, and it registered us. Now, what this is warning us is that we don't have configured for this application because we're in development mode. We don't have an email server configured. All right, because you know normally when you log in, when you register on a site, uh, they want to make sure it isn't someone like fraudulently entering in someone else's email, you know. Uh, so otherwise it could look, you know, you could create an account for someone else and post all kinds of nonsense and make it look like they are the one that posted it right? Not that anyone would ever do that, right? Anyone in here would ever do that. But because we don't have a regular email uh, server configured, we kind of just fake it. And this link would be emailed and you would click here to confirm your account. So because we don't have an email server, we can just click here to uh, uh, confirm your account and we're confirmed. All right, so to log in, click the log in. Remember me, mzellers at lorraineccc.edu. There's a forget your password. There's a register. Again, because we don't have an email server, forgetting your password wouldn't work to email me anything. But if you did have an email uh, server configured it would. So I'm going to enter my password in and I log in there we go and hello mzellers at lorraineccc.edu so yay, we're logged in. All right, now, how do we keep users from getting to a certain page? All right, log out logs you out, of course. Nothing too exciting there. <coughs> how do we keep users from getting to this uh, certain page? I'm going to look at the privacy page. And I'm going to say, even though you wouldn't do this on a, really app, a real app, but just for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to restrict this so that you have to be logged on. So right now we can go to the privacy page, but I'm going to assume that you can only see the privacy page if you're logged on. That's probably a bad assumption, but hey. How do you do that? Well, if you look...
where did it show that? Which one of these pages? Was it this one? I think it was this one. Oh, to test identity. We need to put authorize that little handy dandy attribute property modifier. We need to put that before a page that we want to have controlled to only allow if logged in. So we're going to go to the privacy page, which is here. I'm going to go into model. And above this, I'm going to say authorize. And it's going to give us a squiggly line. What do you suppose we have to do to fix a squiggly line? At a using statement. Generally speaking, if you have something that you know is right, all right, and it doesn't recognize it, it could be because it's not pointing to that, those classes, that package. So I need to put in this in my page to know what to do. All right? So now if I run, and now it got rid of it, so this page is a page that has to be authorized. So now I go and I run this. If I go to the privacy page, since I set that page to, to, to require authorization, if I'm not logged in, which I'm not logged in yet, right, I just reopened it, it's going to redirect me to the login page and make sure that I'm logged in. So if I click on privacy, I can't view that. I have to log in. So I could register if I wasn't a user. I could whatever. I am registered as a user, so I'm going to log in. And I log in. And then when I'm logged in, it then takes me to the privacy page. So it remembered what I tried to do, and after I logged in, it took me where I wanted to go. Now that I'm logged in, I go to the privacy page, no problem. Really nice. You really don't have to code tons just to get basic, basic authorization going. All right. Now I'm going to go and add a new model, and we're going to scaffold it, and we're going to try to uh, make it work. All right. So. Close this. I'm going to go and copy a model from our earlier example just so I don't have to type. And then I'll change it. So I'm going to create my models folder. All right. All right, mouse. I'm going to add new item. And I'm going to pick a class. And I'm going to new story. All right. 
because that's what this site is supposed to be, a news story site. So I'll click Add. There's my model. I'm going to go in here. And I can create it. Uh, giving me that error. But I copied and pasted the code. How could it possibly be wrong? What do I probably forget to do? I probably forget to import some using something. All right, so that's my model. All right, and yeah, that looks reasonable for a new story. All right, save it. I'm going to go into Pages, right mouse, add a new folder. Called news stories. Right mouse, add new scaffolded item. Now, here's <coughs> here's something where we have to pay attention to what we did before, because if we look, where is our database? Our database is under news. Under data and our context is called application db context. So I am going to copy that name. I don't think that did what I expected it to do. Just remember, someone remember application db context. Application DB contact text. Oh, and there is a rename option. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to go and I'm going to scaffold these guys. The reason I want to do this, I want to put this table in the same table as my user IDs were. You don't have to do that, but that sort of muddies things up if you don't. So I'm going to remember that context, and I'm going to scaffold, add new scaffold item, create the CRUD, the model class is new stories and model, the data context class is news dot data dot what did I say application DB context no it had me worried there okay and all that stuff we go and Oh, do we? Maybe I just can't type it in there. And then I'm going to type add. It's going to do its thing.
I didn't get to do this yesterday as I was practicing this class, so I hope it works. I've been having a lot of problems this week when I thought I knew how to do something and I found out that I didn't. Use that as inspiration. Even though you've been in the field for 75 years, there's still stuff that you don't know. I haven't actually been in the field for 75 years, in case you were wondering. All right. So that seemed to go good. <coughs> we need to create another migration and update the database, of course. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'll go here to my package manager. I need bigger monitor or two monitors or something. So I'm going to create a migration. Goes and does its thing. And then I'm going to update the database. Goes and does its thing. All right. So now let's run this. And let's go and let's add a few news stories. And then we'll make sure that you're logged on to be able to add them or edit them. Or delete them. So I'll go to... Ah, joke's on me. I forgot to put that on there, on the menu. So go and put the menu. So that, where do I go to change to put that on the menu? Oh, yeah. On shared layout. What do I put on the navigation? this and I say news stories slash index All right, let's run this guy. Go to new stories. Go to create new. Uh, Unity Lab Leader tells hilarious jokes. Release date is today, which is 11-7, right? How is it November? How is it 2019? How is it the 7th of November? Want me to, it, it, want me to expand it so you can get a better picture? Oh, shoot, it's not going to let me. Okay. And the summary. Yeah. Handed out microchips to computer class. Okay. Create. And there we go. All right. Now let's think of what we want to make authenticated and what not authenticated, right? Privacy we made authenticated. We probably don't want that authenticated, so we'll take that off. Edit. Yeah, you probably shouldn't be able to go there if you uh, aren't logged in. You should probably shouldn't be able to edit stories. 
shouldn't be able to delete the stories. Well, you should be able to view the stories. So, the list of stories and details we want to, don't need to be authorized. The delete, the edit, and the insert should be authorized. <coughs> so we'll go <coughs> and do that. So I'm going to take it out of the privacy because we just did that to demonstrate. So we took, take it off of there. Now I'm going to go to my news stories and create. I want to force being authorized. Delete. I want to force to be authorized. Details can stay the same. We should we'll allow people to view the details. Edit, I want to be all authorized. And finally, index is okay. So I authorize the ones that do actually do any updating to the database, but I've left the ones that only read only to the, to the database. So now when I run this, I can get the privacy again, which is good. I can go and view the news stories. If I go to edit one, though, I have to be logged in. see that. All right, questions about that. There is something on here, and I'm not asking you to do it, but if you want to play around with it, uh, I can give you a hand with it. I'm going to try to figure it out for next week, and that is in the tutorial, the identity tutorial, there is Migrating to. No, that's not it. Scaffold identity into. Ah, there, there you go. That's what I wanted. Scaffold identity into an existing Razor, Razor project without existing authorization. That would be like if we wanted to take what we did last week and add log on to it, add identity to it. So I wanted to go over that this time, but I had problems with it, so we will skip that. All right. So it's pretty straightforward how to add this. And here's the, <coughs> here's the interesting thing. This is really how software has changed you know, from the time I started 75 years ago to the current day, is that back in the old days, you really created every aspect of your software. So if I was writing software, I would write the logic to do a login. 
all right, and to create database tables or files, probably in those old days, store the data, retrieve the data, and all that. And then I would go and work on my problem domain. My problem domain being, uh, you know, the problem is I was trying to solve. Because really, I'm not, my goal wasn't to create a website that, that or an application that you logged into, right? My goal was to solve some business problem. Your goal today is still to solve the business problem. In the old days, though, and I'm not just saying this to, to moan, but to, to sort of put some of these things in context. In the old days, you had to take care of a lot of overhead on your own. Overhead is stuff that, does, that sort of helps you solve the problem. You have to do it, but it's really not the main event. It's really not what you're doing it for. Whereas here, that's taken care of you uh, for you. So the idea is, is not that your job is going to be done as a programmer. The idea is that the basic functionality that every application or many applications will need is taken care of for you in a framework with modules, all right? And you just have to use those modules and piece them together to make an application. All right. Now that's uh, that's similar skills, but different. All right. You still are going to have to custom write some of your own stuff, right? If you're doing a accounting application, you're still going to have to handle all the accounting. But at least the very basics of I don't have to write a screen that allows me to create a user. I don't have to write a database table that allows me to do that. So part of your job is piecing these components together. And that is good news and bad news. It's good news because if you do everything right and the tool works the way it's supposed to do, some of your work's done for you already. You can get it, knock it done in a fraction of time. I don't know how long it would take me to write something from scratch where you logged in and did all that. But I'll tell you what. It would take me longer than what it did today here in class to go and create a website that had authentication. And it would nowhere be near as functional. And it would nowhere near be as tested. All right? The problem, though, is stuff has to talk together. This worked fine. All right? And we were able to do it. But look at all the files that get created that tell stuff what's going on. Files that we've looked at but haven't spent a lot of time playing with. This code. This code. Something in there is wrong. Ain't gonna work. Alright. Let's just for the heck of it delete this line that says use authorization and run our application. All right. All right, so far so good. Yeah, we get an error, right? And why is that? Because these components were not wired together the way that they were supposed to. I better go back in and change this, otherwise next Tuesday I'm going to be scratching my head why this doesn't work. I'll have to go back and pull up the, the uh, video. More than likely, <laughs> any application you do will require, can I still, I can't do an undo. And what did it say? Use authorization. Thank you. Uh, more than likely, any application you do is going to need this. So uh, 
we'll look over some other options that you can do. Like for example, what if I wanted stuff in the user table besides the user ID, which is an email address and a password? What would we do? Well, there's things that we can do to make sure that happens. All right. So the way today's worked is sort of the sales rep demo of it. Look how great it is. Look how easy it was. The piece that we're missing when you actually work on problems like this is the actual developers like and with these components, with software broken down into components that need to talk to each other the problem can be all over the place. If you have two components talking to each other and something isn't working, there's actually three places where there could be a problem. Could be a problem with component A, how that's set up. Could be a problem with how component B is set up. Could be a problem with how component A is talking to component B. So back in the old days, when we wrote a giant COBOL program, if there was something wrong, guess where the problem was? in the giant COBOL program. Now when we're integrating all these different components before, it really increases the flexibility because there could be issues with individual components or there could be issues with the way things communicate with each other. That's why in a lot of my classes we talk about unit testing and system testing. Unit testing where you test an individual piece, system testing when you test everything all together. All right. Uh, that's all I had uh, for today. Your uh, design was due this week. Uh, if you have stuff, let me know to grade it. Uh, remember, the expectation is that you bring to my attention during lab stuff that you need graded. Uh, that doesn't mean I won't grade it otherwise, but if you bring it to my attention, I'll grade it right there and give you immediate feedback. I've intended to grade stuff that people haven't brought to my attention for the last few weeks, but as we all know about intentions, that doesn't always work out right. So bring it to my attention. We'll see you in lab. I'll go unlock the door, then I'll come back get my files.